how did it all start? My background in aviation originally started with model aeroplanes and then I started skydiving when I was at school in the 80s, 84, and uh, got into full-time jumping a few years later, but also became an aircraft engineer from just leaving school as well. So I've had a big background in aircraft engineering. Started hang gliding seven years ago, became the New Zealand speed hang gliding champion over the last few years. Uh, if it flies, I'm into it. And with my skydiving background, I'm no longer scared of aviating in vertical downward directions, which most pilots uh, are adverse to. But that's one of my really comfortable, happy places. So if it's straight down, that's fine by me. Alongside the high risk project, one of Chuck's more sedate hobbies is building his own plane. Oh, I'm going to take this plane pretty much everywhere. Uh, my dream is to fly around New Zealand and visit all my friends, do adventures with my mates, have a wonderful time and access parts of New Zealand that are really hard to get to otherwise. And my plane's amphibious which means that we can take it to uh, dry runways or go and land in the lakes or the sea. The mental side of these um, these events is what really turns me on. That turning something that's in my mind that I can see as possible and taking that dream and then turning it into a reality is one of the things I love the most. For a man with a CV as diverse and mind-bending as Chucky's, the question has to be asked, what are the highlights? Landing an aeroplane at home for the first time, landing a parachute at home for the first time, building my own plane in the shed, Parachuting underground in China would have to be an absolute highlight. That was absolutely incredible. There's nothing like it. Parachuting underground. <laughs> yeah! Way to stick that, bro. Bravo! Turning a tent into a parachute. I really, really enjoyed that because I don't think anyone believed that it could be done. So I got the right things together, got the right equipment, Spent some time on a sewing machine and had a friend do some sewing for me also and turned a tent into a parachute and jumped it. Like the sports that I do, are, they are dangerous sports and there are accidents and people do die doing these sports, which is always particularly tragic because there's not many of us on the planet. We're a small band of people that are prepared to push ourselves to these kinds of levels. So when one does come along that's totally special and when one departs it's totally sad. Shane McConkie was one of those tragedies. Cut from the same cloth as Chuck, he was an innovator and true original, but died in a ski base jumping accident in 2009. My theory is that the world is a much better place through having known those people. And although what they do is dangerous and um, can be tragic, and having known those people and seeing the energy and the drive to go off and do stuff that hasn't been done before and step outside of the square and try something new and try something different. And I think that's a valuable thing to have in, in the human race. I'm going to jump out of the helicopter at about 1,500 feet above the top of the mountain. I'll be flying the wingsuit at about 160, 180 kilometres an hour and there's definitely pressure on your arms. So this is the bit you fly with. And so you have to actually push against the wind and it's almost like lying on the wind and push really hard with your toes and make sure that the whole wingsuit is actually working and that your leg wing's working efficiently and your arm wings are working properly because this is what you fly. It's the thing with wingsuiting is you're flying your whole body. It's not like flying an aeroplane where you're manipulating the controls of a craft, whether it's a plane or a hang glider or a paraglider. But with this, you're actually flying your whole body. Your mind has got to be in exactly the right space for wingsuiting. Like everything's happening really fast. It's the same with any speed sport. Um, you've got to be able to think ahead, and you've also got to be able to think into the future because everything's happening so fast, because in the next few moments, you're going to go from here to out there, but you, while you're here, your thinking must be out there, so you've already gone around the bend 
before you physically got to it. So there's a bit of a, a change in phase between where you are in actuality and where your mind is. To really make a wingsuit fly properly, you do have to fly your entire body. And the wing underneath your arms is a double surface wing, just like the one between your legs, and it has ribs, just like an aeroplane wing does, which gives it depth. But this whole structure of the wing is, is your body, is your arms and your chest and your legs. So you really have to fly your whole body and, and feel the wind on your body. And it, this is like the biggest part. So you do a lot of flying with your chest and how you roll your shoulders and how you shape yourself to actually lie on the wind and give yourself the maximum amount of forward penetration. And when I first started wingsuiting it was just like the I'm a bird and I'm flying dream. Same kind of thing, you put your arms out and you fly along and that was the kind of dream I had when I was a kid. How exciting is that? There's still absolutely nothing like flying close to the planet using nothing but your arms and legs. <laughs> I reckon a falcon would be close to wing sitting, especially if you've ever seen them stooping and they tuck their wings up and just go and just dropping out of the sky. I think that would be close. In fact, I felt a bit like that when I first get out of the helicopter and then dive down for speed before flattening out and flying down the ridge. That's just how it is. You, you're almost weightless because you're accelerating so much and just drilling a hole in the atmosphere on your head. 